I should have asked you a question, but it's probably not the time now. <laughs> What's that? You can ask. Are you Orthodox? Yes. Hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm in the one. Russian Orthodox Church. Ah, just wonder. Yeah. I'm in the Serbian Orthodox Church. Okay. Yeah, I've, I have some really good friends that are in the Serbian Orthodox Church. Hmm. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, and, and by the way, if you would, uh, I, I saw a uh, bio of you that was an older bio. So maybe you might want to give maybe a more updated bio, but uh, Dr. Tolison joins me today. Hopefully everybody can hear. All right. Let me know in the, in the uh, chat, if you can't hear, but we're going to go ahead and start. Um, we're going to be covering the excellent book, Christocentric cosmology of St. Maximus, the confessor by uh, Dr. Tolison. And he is a professor in Oslo still. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And uh, if you want to give us a little bit of your background and, and what you studied and, uh, what your specialties are, and then we'll get into the book. Yeah. Uh, well, I have uh, worked on philosophy my whole academic life, and uh, I started out, I suppose, um, well, reading Aristotle mainly, and also had a long colloquium with some friends on Heidegger's Sign on Sight, which I read, I think, uh, we used two years, I think, each week during the terms. But later on, 30 years ago, I decided to turn to um, early Christian thought. So uh, for the last 30 years, I worked on the Greek church fathers. But in the context, I think, on the background of and in the context of ancient and late ancient philosophy. So, um, yeah. And I published a lot of articles in addition to the three books on Oxford Early Christian Studies, the one book on Maximus, which we are probably going to talk about and this activity and participation. And the last one was on St. Theodore the Stulite's Defense of the Icons. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a great book, too. Yeah, I just... and now I'm working on the second Maximus book. OK, excellent. And what will what's the uh, the second Maximus books topic going to be? Well, the working title is um, the metaphysics of Maximus the Confessor in the context of late antique uh, or ancient philosophy. But I will go through uh, mainly, I think, um, the same topics that I went through in the first book. But, uh, I mean, I've learned so much since that book was published. So there's a lot of things that I want to go through once again and develop further. And also a couple of new topics that I have not treated before, and it seems that nobody has treated before. Excellent. And I also would like to write on Maximus Christology, I suppose, right. as far as it is an ontological and metaphysical question. Excellent. Okay. Let's maybe start with, uh, let me ask you the question. Um, in, the, in the introduction, you get into the relationship between St. Maximus and philosophy. And I think a lot of times in maybe in the West, in America, uh, uh, American converts, especially to orthodoxy, uh, oftentimes come out of evangelicalism. And, and a lot of times they have the attitude that Maximus and, and orthodoxy, uh, it doesn't really have anything to do with philosophy. Um, but there's many orthodox saints and uh, church fathers who were very uh, in, interested in philosophy, very influenced by philosophy. You could argue the Cappadocians, obviously, St. Gregory and Nyssa. Uh, St. John of Damascus with Aristotle and St. Maximus. So what is the general attitude and influence of philosophy and the philosophy of his day, late antiquity upon St. Maximus? I think the main uh, influences are from, uh, the, um, let's say, Alexandrian Neoplatonism or the school of commentators of Alexandria. Uh, there is a lot that can be highlighted in Maximus from that point of view. But, you know, it's very difficult to, to identify exactly what he read. Uh, because they refer to the fathers, but don't refer to the philosophers or those outside the faith. But uh, it seems to me that there is a connection through uh, Sophronius, uh, the patriarch, later patriarch of, uh, of uh, Jerusalem, who Maximus knew when he was not a patriarch, and uh, it seems that uh, Sophronius um, had some contact with uh, this uh, shadowy figure, probably, of Stephanos of Alexandria, a Neoplatonist Christian thinker. And I think there is a channel in there. And I also 
like to mention that um, a young friend of mine, uh, Louis Salas, just published an article on Maximus and his Alexandrian background. Okay. I'll make a note of that. Which is rather interesting. Yes, um, that is interesting. In fact, most people, I think, who do have an interest in theology, they, they've heard of Maximus probably in relationship to Christology and the Sixth Ecumenical Council dealing with two wills and two energies and Maximus's dispute with Pyrrhus. But he wrote quite a bit on uh, topics like originism and you know morals in the Christian life quite a bit of a, a grandiose metaphysics, I would say, and that gets into the Logi doctrine. And that's what we're going to talk about today, which is that uh, it's a form of exemplarism. Uh, this is how you begin the book. And I, I like that because when I was a Roman Catholic, I'd read a lot of Augustine and, and a decent amount of Aquinas back at, at the time. And I knew that they had a pretty interesting uh, exemplarism doctrine, which is similar to Platonism, Neoplatonism, the idea that there's a pattern or, or a form of things that is in the divine mind that becomes the pattern by which uh, God creates the, uh, the the world on. But you take this in the first chapter in a different direction from the way it's usually conceived in the West. And this was one of the, the reasons that I found personally problems in the Latin view of divine exemplars, which is that there's a tendency to equate them with the divine essence. And that, I think, is a really almost platonic position. But uh, you talk about how Christian exemplarism isn't platonic. And I thought that was great because that was something I read uh, many years ago that, that really influenced me to, to come out of the Latin tradition of Roman Catholicism. Um, could you speak to that? Why uh, Christian exemplarism isn't pl Platonism? <laughs> I'm a bit more confused about that issue now. Uh, than I was when I wrote the book. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, there is a, Max Bos has some kind of uh, uh, exemplarism. There are patterns, I would say, this logo uh, for created things, uh, and also for, not only for individuals, particulars, but uh, even for species in general. Uh, so there is some kind of, um, um, eternal divine knowledge of what God wants to create. And I think that uh, the Logoi are um, what this God decides to create. Mm -hmm. um, this is probably for my, uh, the way of working, out, working it out in the second Maxwell's book, which I'm uh, dealing with now. Uh, God knows everything, but the term Logoi seems to be a term that he uses for exactly what God wants to create. Right. Um, and then there is a tricky question about um, whether these logoi are understood to be a part of God's essence or God's so-called energies. I avoid the term energies for some reasons uh, and speak about activities. And um, I'm a bit confused about these things now because uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, the Logoi are eternally in God's um, intellect. Maximus can put it that way, speak about God's right. intellect or mind. And if they are what God thinks he would like to do, um, Why are they not a part of the divine essence? I think it's um, this issue of uh, cataphatic or positive and apophatic or negative theology mm. is a bit more dialectic than it is usually presented as. Well, sir, I think that... Yeah. Yeah? No, go ahead. Please. Well, so you, you certainly... Uh would know more about Maximus than me. I've read, a, uh, I mean, I only have access to the English, so I've, I've read a good amount of his English works and the secondary commentaries. So uh, I'm nowhere, you know, in any realm of expertise on this, but um, I, I tend to think that he's probably in line with the, you know, uh, the rest of the Orthodox tradition. I mean, I know that you can't just say, well, because there's an Orthodox tradition, everybody has the same uh, ideas. There can be divergences, certainly, but you know, we get people, uh, uh, you know, you get in, in Dionysius, for example, you know, he reads the 
the logi as uh, processions, as, as the, the, the emanations or processions that come from God being the energies as well as uh, the logi. I know Dr. Bradshaw reads it that way. And then you get uh, St. Gregory Palamas looking back and he seems to read it in the same way that there's different types of, of energies. There's different types of logi. Uh, excuse me, uh, the, the Logi are, w- are one of the classes of energies, but they're a distinct yeah, type absolutely. of energy related to the created order. But at the yeah. same time, I recognize what you're saying, that that there's also a sense in which, well, how is it that they're eternal, right? Because if God knows from all eternity, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that he has to bring into being all of the things mm-hmm. or all the potentia that he knows from all eternity. So I think that's maybe where the issue gets difficult. Um, you, you probably read that there's a Florovsky paper on the Logi that's really good where he kind of deals with that issue and tries to tease out why he thinks that there could be a potentia uh, and, a, and a, an infinite number of ideas, you could say, that, that God doesn't have to actualize all of them. Well, I think so. Uh, but I've been challenged on that as well, because I think that you cannot say that the divine mind is, some, uh, is uh, in any way uh, limited. So God, uh, of course, may know all possibilities. But mm-hmm. uh, I came to the uh, idea that... Um, it seems that the term logos or logoi are used uh, for those um, things that God actually settles on thought wills that He will, will create. Right. But I have one comment on this um, uh, divine essence um, logoi as part of divine essence because it seems to me that um, w- we we can say that okay, the logoi are eternally in the divine mind or divine intellect. Okay, what is the divine mind and divine intellect? And then Maximus says that, well, God is not a mind, is, is not an intelligible object at all. So, in a sense, it disappears, of course, beyond the horizon, which we cannot have any access to. Mm-hmm. But I would think that there is some kind of um, gradual or continuity between uh, the completely transcendent God on the one hand and God approaching towards us on the other hand. So it's very difficult for me to say that the logo, for instance, and the so-called energies are not a part of the, um, are not a part of the essence, are not related, um, are really distinct from the essence. I think it's more like, um, uh, like uh, some kind of, I wouldn't say emanative picture, but, um, at least a certain continuity, I think. Right. I mean, my my understanding would be that, you know, the, the typical um, Cappadocian or, or Orthodox perspective stating it like the, the energies, as John Damascus says, signify and proceed from the essence, but yeah. can't be uh, fully, totally equated to it. No. Uh, but then we have to distinguish, I think, also between the internal and the external activities. Right. Was it internally, I suppose, that um, um, how can they be distinguished from the essence? I mean, uh, I don't understand that. Yeah, well, those are those are really difficult issues. Um, maybe let's move on then to in the beginning chapter, uh, and and you, maybe your view has uh, evolved from when you wrote this, but um, you talk about the 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 Plotinian view of levels of reality of the one and then the intellect and the noose and then soul being that sort of uh, that triad that's within the Plotinian uh, approach and how there's similarities. But then you, you kind of lay out uh, three, I think you, you, you class it as three major differences between what Maximus presents and what uh, is present in the Plotinian view. So I was looking for my note. Yes, yeah, so you said that against the Neoplatonic perspective, what Maximus does is alter the view to say that creation is a real potentiality. Um, the The doctrine of God creating presupposes and is based on a, a free will that God has. And that number three, the essence of God transcends all relations. And so there's not a direct correlation between the, the monad and what springs forth from the monad. There's a difference. Would you still have that? Uh, would you still believe in those three basic points of distinction? Yes, I will. Okay. Uh, and I was lost, but I don't want to comment on the will, the aspect of the will, the divine will, because um, uh, of course there is a divine freedom, but um, 
my friend uh, Professor Emilsson, he has argued in a book uh, on Plotinus that um, there isn't any major difference between uh, the Christian and the uh, Plotinian view on divine freedom. I think it's a misunderstanding that God is somehow the, fir- the one in the Plotinus is necessitated. Mm. I don't know, but it seems to me that uh, also Rist in his book, The Road to Reality, uh, Plotinus wrote that um, uh, what one has to understand about the one is that um, um, the one wills to be, be itself and is willing to be itself. Uh, it is that from that that all processes um, uh, external to the one uh, have a starting point somehow mm-hmm. without the one wanting this to happen because the one wants only to be itself. Right. And there is a very important distinction, I think, between Christian approach and Maximus approach and, and the Neoplatonist because uh, uh, the Christian God does not only will itself, it will itself as distribute of good and not in a general way, but in a particular way. Uh, in the way that it addresses um, uh, particulars and persons and entities in the world. And you cannot say that of the Neoplatonist one. It's not interested in us at all. Yeah, exactly. What about the question of agency and, and in a sense, uh, I know this is a difficult term, but personhood, because, you know, in the in the Orthodox conception or in the way Maximus uh, speaks of, of God, in triad and also in the incarnation, you have a personal relationship. There's the idea that, you know, for Maximus, he takes these, these logi and basically in hypostatizes them. He makes them personal to the logos. And so then the created order becomes a, uh, a process of restoration, right? On the part of the incarnation and resurrection of the logos that you'll argue in the later chapters. And that would also be another kind of obvious difference too, that, that, that really, um, and I'm not an expert on uh, Neoplatonism or Plotinus, but uh, I'm, I'm assuming that the idea of incarnation really wouldn't make any sense or personal agency on the part of the monad, right? No, it would not. I think it's, um, uh, it's very important what you say now, because uh, um, you can say that uh, in the Neoplatonist system, you would have the intellect that would reservoir of the divine ideas somehow. Uh, which the soul then transports into uh, material reality. But uh, even if the Logos himself contains all the Logoi, and therefore somehow they are uh, as if in a divine intellect, it's not the same thing, uh, simply because uh, the Logos himself is a person, a hypostasis, a person, Uh, who can address and relate to other things which he creates, which is out of the question with a Neoplatonist and a Neoplatonist uh, uh, hypothesis. Exactly. Um, what is the uh, relationship between this um, ph- the, the ph- uh, philosophical notion of the Porphyrian tree? Maximus takes this Porphyrian tree in the categories and applies them to uh, his metaphysic and um, that becomes sort of a gradation of the structure of the created order. Is that correct? Yeah. So he has no problem using that 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 uh, that structure. Um, no, I don't think so. I think it's. Um, I think uh, there are certain things said that I have to think through more thoroughly. But uh, even so, I think it's uh, the Porphyrian tree, in one sense, is a part of this. Right. Um, yeah. The created world is, uh, somehow reflects uh, totality that is uh, contemplated in God. And somehow I think the Potiphyrian tree is a way to describe this. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and I th- would you still agree, I know you're, you're hesitant on the issue of will, uh, but I mean, the doctrine of creation uh, and the, the, uh, the idea of things beginning in a point in time, Right or uh, out of nothing, ex nihilo. I mean, th- these are n- other areas where there would be a clear contrast with any of the Hellenic positions, the pagan Hellenic positions. Well, I think there are, the, are at least two things that I would uh, point out. The one is the beginning of, um, I mean, that uh, the world started a uh, definite number of time units ago, uh, which also, of course, uh, tells us something about the divine will mm-hmm. in uh, the Christian system being very different from the Neoplatonist. 
And uh, on the other hand, um, it's also this um, dimension that uh, I think uh, none of the basic principles in, in the Neoplatonist system will be able to, or they will be able to relate to particular persons in time and space. And also, of course, uh, being incarnated or something like that is out of the question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you you mentioned uh, in about uh, pages 42, 3, 4, where you're talking about um, St. Athanasius, St. Basil, St. Maximus. They all defend the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, and that, that's contrasted to the... Uh, the platonic view and and one one question i have here is that and you, you i don't recall that you ever said this but it was just something that occurred to me it's almost like is the neoplatonic view uh basically taking the entire a created order you could say i know they're not believing in creation but is it basically applying the notion of eternal generation that we would apply to the logos to the sun are they basically just saying that the monad eternally generates all of the existing order it doesn't have a beginning in time but it's it is basically always emanated from the monad are they taking that eternal generation and just applying it to everything there is a there is a distinction they make uh, which is um, rather subtle i think uh, you find it mainly in um, in uh, in proclus and uh, the neoplatonist proclus and uh, his students probably that um, all the divine principles or the intelligible principles are eternal in the strict sense. Mm -hmm. But what about the world then? Well, it's everlasting. And it it, it is a conceptual distinction, uh -huh. but in practice it means that the, the world never originated. It just was there. Right. As long as there were divine principles, the world was there. But I mean, the dignified title of being eternal, mm -hmm. they are preserved. For the highest principles but okay. being everlasting that goes for material things as well okay the um let's move on to talk about the um whole parts relationships and the uh one the many so in the created order you have basically a a, a gradation or hierarchical structure of as you said sort of the many and then there's the relationships the parts of whole amongst all these different objects and and um, um, and then up into the species, or the genera, the species, and up into the, the categories of the universals. And one thing uh, that a lot of people, I think, mistake in, in Maximus, uh, a lot of uh, people in the Latin tradition of exemplarism make the mistake of thinking that the Logi are the same thing as universals. But in fact, universals and Maximus are a created uh, feature of the created world that are patterned on themselves on the Logi. They're not themselves the Logi. Uh, and so I, I like the, the multiple sections where you treat it on that. Um, could you speak to that that issue and, and, and how you see Maximus uh, fleshing that out? I think that you can say that the logo are principles of a created order. And this created order reflects somehow what God had meant it to be then, which is a system of particular species and genera. And I think that this whole part um, aspect of it. I mean, particulars being parts of um, species and so on onto the top of it, well, all is included in the basic concept of being essences or UCI mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, it's very important for Maximus because it also somehow opens the perspective of um, kind of universal transformation of all being because it seems to me that one basic idea in maximus at least uh, as far as i can see it is that there is no waste in the created world there's nothing that shall be so to say let aside destroyed or whatever it shall all be transformed so the whole idea that um, particulars belong to more comprehensive units or holes in the hierarchical system um, means that the whole of creation is interconnected. Right. Everything has to do with everything else somehow. And also in the incarnation of Christ, this becomes very meaningful when Christ is incarnated in the human microcosm. The one who contains all the logoi is um, 
incarnated in the being that is somehow in the center of the world, which is um, the starting point, I think, for this um, um, this uh, transformation through the work of Christ. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm eager to get to that section where you talk about the the transformation and then, and then our participation in that. Uh, I did have a couple more questions before we move in that in that direction. First one is Maximus has this kind of uh, obscure text where he talks about the monad um, being tra- uh, uh, moving to the dyad and then being transcended in the triad. It's commented on by Gregor Nyssa and many other people. He mentions it. Yeah, he mentions it in the uh, uh, questions and answers as well. So in this section where you're talking about the divine ideas and the creation of the cosmos, you speak of um, in Ambigua 10, matter is the dyad. And you speak of the dyad. It seems that in, in Maximus, dyad us- usually refers to creation, of, to, uh, that it relates to matter. And and, um, and since matter is not eternal, uh, Maximus seems to think that the dyad is insufficient. And so could you ex- explain or expound on that passage? where? You sp- how do you read and understand this, the passage where he talks about the monad moving to the triad and then being transcended, excuse me, the dyad then being transcended by the triad. Well, no, you're moving into very difficult things, but uh, the first, um, the point of this quotation from St. Gregory the Theologian, which he comments on in Ambiguum 1, isn't that correct? Uh, he does say it in, in 1, yes, he does. Yeah. Seems to be part of um, um, for me it enters into his uh, notions of uh, uh, cataphatic theology that we use a lot of different metaphors or Mm -hmm. images or whatever when we speak about God and all of them are important we have in the scriptural world somehow we have the God emerging as if there were three distinct entities and we have also sayings of course that gainsay that in which you see the unity of the three hypostases and I think also Christian philosophy has developed a lot of different uh, patterns uh, uh, in accordance with which we can talk about this and I think that his comments on St. Gregory the Theologian's obscure saying is part of that because mm. he says later on in the text that this does not tell us about the movement within the Trinity itself. It tells us, us about how we how we move in our minds when thinking of it. The mystery transcends uh, our grasp. So that is one thing. But when it comes to this term dyad in the context of the tenth ambiguum, I think we are in quite a different world, uh, namely in this world, so to say. Um, I have worked through those passages again, and I find them rather uh, intricate and difficult to um, to figure out exactly what um, he is at in them. And I also understand that um, there are different interpretations of it. But it still seems to me that when he introduces this term of dyad and the dialectic between monad and dyad in Ambigum 10, he speaks of how God, uh, as a basic principle of world order, uh, delimits and orders a world that is divisible, uh, manifold, multiplying itself. But this multiplying division and so on is not is only uh, possible because of the divine. Uh, monad that somehow establishes the principles of mathematics, which again somehow oh, are principles for the creative gotcha. world. Okay, but it's very tricky, very difficult. So the the ability to divide, uh, to to dyad things, to put into part one and two, relates to um, what would have to be truly divisible in the created order because in God there's not really division there's there's distinction but not division and separation so dyadic reality would only truly apply to the created order I see now I, I think that's but, uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the impression I got when I last worked through it and what I wrote in a new chapter uh, for the second book on Maximus uh, is that um, 
the text somehow tells us that God, as the, as the monad, is also the principle of mathematics. And then you are into the world, uh, then you have the principles somehow, the basic intelligible principles of the world, which then is somehow reflected in an order that is divisible, multipliable, and so on and so forth. Yes, gotcha. Um, yeah, I can't wait to read the next book. Um, <laughs> could you speak to this issue of, um, again, so, so God embodies himself in all being, cosmically speaking, both in a Neoplatonic sense and in Maximus' sense, is there any other way other than the ways that we've spoken already that would distinguish the view, um, you know, other than the personhood, agency, incarnation? Is there anything else? I mean, uh, before we move on into the next section, anything else in that, in that, that distinguishes Neoplatonism, I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, I think I can say at least one thing. It seems to me that uh, the Logoi, they are divine principles of what God wants to create, as has been said already. But uh, I think that um, I don't I don't think that the cre creatures participate in the Logoi. I don't think that there is a relation of participation when it comes to the Logoi, because I think that the Logoi are God's definitions, let us say that, for what beings are to be. But what they participate in are the so-called uh, activities or energies. Mm -hmm. So the Logoi somehow delimits um, the amount of the energy that can be received by a particular being. And there you have, there you have somehow the creation out of nothing um, idea because uh, uh, well, I have, well, you, you, God has an idea of, let's say that, God has an idea of what it is to be a human being, and there's no continuity between that idea and the existence of the human being. It is created out of nothing. Mm -hmm. So there's a basic distinction or basic right. gap between. But even so, this kind of essence, when realized because of God's will, mm -hmm. is able to participate what right. flows from God. Uh, to a richer degree than, for instance, a stone or a butterfly or a flower has. So I think that um, the Logoi are strictly divine principles in accordance with which God creates out of nothing. But what is created is in such a condition that it can participate in what God gives in different degrees according to the essence. Right. Have. So <clears throat> modes, uh, I think the way Palamas, for example, speaks of it, he says that all creation will participate in the restoration, but in different ways and in different modes. So, uh, you know, a rock is not going to participate in theosis in the same way or mode as a person who's in the church and oh. participating in, in uh, divine energy would be participating. But there is a, there's, uh, and you're saying that the logi of the of the different aspects, the manifold of creation, uh, determines and delimits to what extent, uh, say, inanimate things will participate, or for uh, animate beings, or excuse me, uh, personal beings, created humans, um, there is the potentia. I think you spoke of it like we we all have the natural potentia for grace, and this is the distinction between Maximus's view and say a Thomistic view because creatures are are made for grace and they have that potentia but whether they actualize that will depend on each individual hypostasis movement of the will and what maximus calls recapitulating the virtues in themselves right so it's potentially there for every person but it requires grace and theosis to actualize that in a full deification sense is that correct yeah, I think so, and that, that's also that's also the reason why uh, Maximus anthropology becomes very important, and his uh, doctrine of the incarnation. Because I mean, there is a lot of beings in this world that cannot move into this pattern of virtues or transformation by themselves. But uh, that then I suppose that uh, I think that um, the picture is that through the human being, as uh, the the. Um, as the human nature of Christ realized 
in the church is some kind of transformational uh, fabric. Right. And you, you picture it like a, a circle and the logos in the center, uh, the logi, the circle around him. And so the, the fall seems to have disrupted this original Edenic pattern. And then so basically it's kind of jilted out of whack. And then the incarnation and works of Christ, death, burial, resurrection, this, uh, it, would it be accurate to say this kind of like sets things back on their course in terms of um, how the created order is sort of jilted out of whack from its logi. The work of Christ so. is to move it back into that unity. But the, cre the, the, the creatures that possess will and agency, humans, they still have the ability to, to move towards their logi or to act against it. And that's where we get the issue of virtue and vice, correct? I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure that, that, that I understood and was getting. Um, before we get to the, the more of that, I, I did want to ask another question about the threefold embodiment. And, and I raised this because of the Thomistic and the, the sort of the Roman Catholic tendency to separate natural revelation, uh, excuse me, natural theology from revealed theology. Um, but for example, Father Staniloy, he begins his uh, Orthodox Dogmatics Volume 1 by talking about that, that for Orthodoxy, there's not as much of a, a there's a distinction, but the content is the same. So that what we see in Scripture and what we see in the created order and what we say in, see in the incarnate Christ, it's the Logos embodied in all of these. And so the meanings of both Scripture, uh, creation, and the incarnate Christ himself the meaning is the same. It's just different modes of the transmission of that meaning or that logi. And so that's a key difference between, I would say, between the, the natural theology uh, of, of uh, Thomism. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. Uh, there was also, okay, uh, in, the, in the beginning of the Tenth Ambiguum, I think Maximus also says something about, uh, I don't recall exactly the terminology now, but the, the written law maybe and the natural law. I suppose he uses those two terms, written law and natural law. Yeah. And they, they teach the same. They teach the same. So it's, I, I mean, it's it's very difficult, I think, to separate um, uh, one kind of revelation as being, um, let's say, you know, natural revelation or in the sense of um, uh, opening up for some kind of natural um, theology and the other revelational. I think they're both somehow aspects of the same thing. Or all the three, of course, when Christ exactly. also seen part of it. Um, let me ask you a question about uh, procession and the contraction of beings. And this relates to uh, the world coming into order on the pattern of the Logi. And you mentioned already that sort of delimitation that occurs for each type for the different types of beings. But this is interesting because this shows that the created order is also uh, directly connected to the soteriological telos of beings as well. So there's this this purpose and this this uh, eschatological telos idea of logi that's also in, contained within the meanings of the beings in their created order as well. So you talk about uh, being given being. Then you talk about ever being and then ever well being. Could you speak to that triadic uh, relationship there? Yeah, it's um, it seems to me that uh, I'm not sure exactly how to put it, or I'm not sure exactly how Maximus thinks about it. But uh, you have this triad of logoi, and I wonder how they uh, are connected together. Uh, it seems to me that here you also have a major difference between. Uh, Neoplatonism on the one hand and Maxwell's Christian philosophy on the other hand because uh, uh, there, there are not just, there are not simply divine ideas. Mm -hmm. There are also certain uh, obligations or certain telos in it all. Uh, you move from your natural stance in a, in a sense, the way you are institute, constitute naturally uh, to um, for intellectual beings, the development of virtues, mm -hmm. which brings you into um, uh, this uh, logo of uh, well-being, mm -hmm. and which then culminates when you fulfill your course 
uh, in living in accordance with logo of, uh, logos of eternal well-being. And it seems to me that um, uh, for intellectual beings, uh, it's a kind of natural development that should at least be natural uh, because that's the, the destiny or the, the goal of our lives to move in this correct way. Um, and what about the rest of the creation then? Well, once again, I think that uh, that is connected with um, um, the incarnational model that Christ somehow is the, not only the, he is the creator and the microcosm per se, the most important fundamental, uh, which means that also this uh, grace of transformation uh, flows out to what is not human, the whole created order. Uh, yeah. I wonder. Yeah. Well, you, you, you spoke of... Uh, so the ontological laws and the bonds in the hierarchical, hierarchical agreement of reality are all in harmony. And this also relates to the conversion of beings. So there's the, there's the being... There's the, the the coming to be of beings, and then there's also, as a result of the fall, obviously, the conversion of beings. And this is where Maximus brings in this relationship of grace, right? Because supernatural grace is necessary. It's not all sort of a, a isomorphic single relationship here. There is a, a participation that's needed uh, where we do need more than just our created nature to to have a real participation in an uncreated grace, correct? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think that the world is somehow, it's a manifold in a sense. Uh, that is the um, distribution or expansion, uh, of course, which is natural. Uh, but it's built in such a way that it can contract and it contracts via uh, Christ uh, and participates in... Um, eternal well-being uh, on that so so that, so the contraction you're saying relates specifically to Christ becoming incarnate be yeah I think so okay uh, at, at least at least um, yeah I think so okay it's it's um, uh, well here you have the idea in Maximus I think that the incarnation is not God's rescuing plan when something went wrong. It's... And it could, of course, not uh, come as a surprise for God that things went as they did. So the incarnation is, um, whatever way it could be imagined to have taken place without the fall, was the eternal plan of God. Right. So that the creation of the human being is not simply the creation of a being in addition to all other beings. It's the creation of a being in which God wanted to become incarnate. Yes. And therefore, to work out the transformation of all right and that's where you get um one say crucial cosmological difference between say the tendencies in western theology and i'm not speaking of all western theologians i know there's some especially in the modern period uh, people like von balthazar who would like to try to give acquiescence to some of these eastern cosmic ideas but the doctrine of recapitulation is directly connected to uh, the Logi, uh, this is really uh, fundamental in, uh, in Maximus's theology. And I see this as a big difference, again, between, say, Latin theology and, and Orthodox theology, is there's a kind of a loss of this doctrine of uh, recapitulation, that everything that Adam lost is recapitulated in Christ. Of course, it doesn't mean everyone is necessarily saved, because Maximus writes against, you know, Origen's view uh, of this stuff in the Ambigua. But there is this cosmic scope that's I think kind of lost in the, the Latin view. Would you would you agree with that? I agree completely with that. Okay, and hence I mean, why you I'm... wrote this book, <laughs> the, the the cosmic mm -hmm. right, uh, mystery of Christ, um, mm -hmm. or the cosmic scope. Excuse I mean, me. I mean, also uh, well, I would say fifty years ago I was I was a Protestant, and uh, I remember very clearly that. Uh, one of the things that I didn't understand about Protestantism was that there was a lot of talk about the salvation of the soul of the per human person. But uh, what about creation? Well, we believe that God created the world, but there was nothing more to it. I mean, things might have changed since that, but that was a very strong impression I got that uh, the created order doesn't matter. 
Uh, when it comes to Roman Catholic theology, I don't know much about it. I have studied, of course, um, uh, a bit uh, Thomas Aquinas, the Summa Theologia, large parts of it, as a matter of fact. But um, I think that uh, the only place that where I found such a comprehensive view of um, all creation included in the, the soteriological picture was in orthodoxy and especially in Maximus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was uh, deeply satisfactory, I think. Um, could you speak maybe a little bit to uh, in relation to recapitulation? And this comes up in Ambiguum Forty One. What is the connection between man as a macrocosm, microcosm, and Christ as the mic macrocosm, microcosm? I think that uh, one cannot separate the creation of man from uh, the from the incarnation. I think from the idea of the incarnation, the human being is is created for the incarnation, which gives, of course, a very uh, high dignity to humanity. So I think that. Um, when, when the human being is uh, pictured in uh, Ambiguum 41 as the, a microcosm interconnected with all aspects of, of the world, the created world, the intelligible and the sensible, um, that is only somehow part of the picture. The whole picture is when Maximus um, talks about uh, Christ moving into the created order as a human being, because then I think that the whole divine purpose or plan is somehow uh, starting to get to be fulfilled through Christ. So I don't think that you could, um, you could of course imagine somehow uh, a created order in which human beings did not fall in sin and then interconnected everything and united everything in love to God. But um, I think that is not exactly what Maximus is after. I think his main focus is to show that the human being is created for the incarnation. And that the incarnation itself of uh, the Son of God is somehow the, the real interconnecting power. So it's, it's, it's not a plan B. Um... Uh, the Orthodox um, Orthodox theologian uh, Paniotos Nellis, he has a great chapter in his book on deification where he talks about how it's not a plan B that that really man is made in the image of Christ. You could say, yeah. Um, you you it's mentioned, wonderful. yeah. Uh, you mentioned the um, Christ. <clears throat> sometimes we hear this term Christ, the universal man, and that he can recapitulate all of uh, human nature in his single divine hypostasis. Is it? crucial that we understand that the, the, the way that this is possible is because of the fact that Christ is a divine person, he's the second person of the Godhead, uh, taking on human nature, and that, that the fact that he's a divine hypostasis is actually what makes it possible for him to recapitulate all of human nature in his singular divine hypostasis. Yeah, I think so. Um, you could just spoil that. I don't think I have to comment on that. Let's see, uh, a couple more things here. When you speak of the manifold, are you speaking of the, the constitution of created beings kind of spreading out from the one God and then you have the manifold of beings? Is that, is that the, yeah. the um, and then that recapitulation is literally all of the created order, right? So we're, we're one thing that's kind of forgotten in the eschaton uh, in some of the Western traditions is the, the importance of the body. Um, would you would you say that that I know, you know, St. Gregory Palamas, he stresses this quite a bit, but is it also there in Maximus as well that the eschatological vision, even though I know Maximus does speak of a perception in the eschaton of the Logi in a couple texts, but would you agree that he also has this uh, uh, important role for the body as well? Yeah, I think there is an important role for the body as well. Uh, of course, as a philosopher, I always try to imagine exactly what that could mean, but uh, that is rather difficult, of course. Uh, but it seems to me that 
the, the body, not only the human body, but the body of the whole of the world, uh, is in, it has an important role to play. But then, of course, um, what it ex exactly means to be transfigured on day five is very difficult. Right. You can, of course, talk about it in theoretical language, but um, yeah, I think the imagination somehow lets us down a bit. Let's get into the, the more maybe the, uh, the the what I found to be maybe the most difficult section, which is the uh, notions of in what sense we're speaking of participation, uh, because um, as you said, the, the logi seem to delimit uh, what types of participation creatures have in God, and so we know that it's a participation in uncreated grace, but um, there's. There's, for example, God giving creature, uh, you speak of them as a say, you speak of time and space as a receptacle of being. Creatures come to be, and then they, they have, say, uh, uh, participation in being or existence. But then other uh, aspects of, of creation can get higher level, I guess you could say, of participation. Uh, to speak in a, in a uh, anal analogous way. I mean, I know that there, there's not degrees in God, but in another sense, there is different levels of participation. I guess this is the, this is what's difficult. But I mean, could you speak to how you see um, how you see these 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 different aspects of participation, maybe in a little more depth? Yeah, this is one of the points where I've changed my mind a bit uh, from uh, the first Maxwell's book, The Christocentric Cosmology, where I have a chapter on participation. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, the change of view came forward in the next book, Activity and Participation, where I also wrote uh, the chapter on Maximus, or sections on Maximus in different kind of chapters. Mm -hmm. Because I think that... Um, here it's, of course, um, the starting point should be, or what we can say something about, actually, is the human being. When the human being is, in this, um, is, is created, it is created in such a way that it participates in, in God as being. Uh, and when it moves correctly, or in accordance with um, its nature, and therefore develops virtues, it moves in accordance with the um, logos of well-being and receives God as well-being. And it culminates in the reception of God as eternal well-being. What exactly does this participation uh, notion bring with it? Um, well, in the Neoplatonist, in Platonist, the Neoplatonist system, it seems to me that it's rather difficult to explain exactly what participation is. Uh, but suddenly it struck me, I may be wrong, but I think for me at least it was a solution, that what is participated here in this Christian system of Maximus is God's activity. Well, does that make it easier? Yes, I think so. Because it means that God is active in the creature, mm -hmm as a creature, keeping it in being. Mm -hmm. uh, when the creature somehow develops or realizes, actualizes its potential, that makes it open to participate God in a deeper, further sense. And then it culminates eventually in the participation of eternal well-being. Right. So I think... Um, uh, there is a potential in, in intellectual beings to sort of say, expand their capacity to receive. But um, this is a natural potential that they have. I don't say that grace is... Um, I'm very, I don't feel very secure about this, uh, um, this um, uh, term of supernatural grace. There is a term, an idea of supernatural grace here. But... What exactly does it mean? Does it mean that there's some kind of dramatic uh, division between the created being and its potential and what it receives? Uh, well, yes, but even so, the creature itself, the intellectual creature, may expand 
its receptivity mm -hmm. because it has the potential to do so. Right. And it's met, I think, by God being active towards it mm -hmm. and receives this activity into itself and gets gradually transformed. When, when you're using activity there, uh, I mean, do you see that as synonymous with energeia? I mean, for example, yeah. in, uh, in Colossians and Philippians, Paul uses energeia, that God's power at, in, at work in me, for example, he says. I do that. It's, uh, it's, um, I translate the term uh, energeia uh, mainly as activity. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's, what I, that's what I expected. I just wanted to make sure because sometimes people will um, get, get get hung up on different terms. But um, yeah, I, I think that was a, a well stated there, well explained. I mean, that's how I took what you were saying here. But uh, you know, like I said, I look forward to seeing uh, in what way you'll you'll distinguish. Let me ask you this: Do, do you do you read? Uh, and I know that maybe your your emphasis is Maximus may not be Saint Gregory Palamas, but do you read Saint Gregory Palamas as following and, and being basically consistent with St. Maximus? Yes, I do. Okay. I think that uh, St. Gregor Palamas is uh, not the same kind of philosopher. Uh, he doesn't have all the distinctions which Maximus I, is able to to handle. Mm -hmm. uh, that probably because Maximus is closer to a very important um, uh, philosophical, philosophical tradition, which uh, still is somehow alive in his days. Uh, Gregory Palamas lives in a quite, quite different age, but as an interpreter of Max, Maximus, I think he's very good. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking here at my notes, make sure I didn't have, see if I'm missing anything. One, one mistake that or, or area where a lot of people um, in the Western world when they're looking at Maximus is to, um, to, for example, they'll look at the eschaton and they'll say, well, you know, is this really different from origin or originism? I mean, isn't Maximus just basically saying, uh, you know, kind of the same idea that if there's a recapitulation, if there's a restoration of all being, then doesn't it seem to follow that all beings are necessarily saved and i think the key point that you stressed in the book with the ability of uh, intel uh, intelligent agents or uh, uh, beings with with will they have the ability to move away from virtue and so that then kind of conditions you could say each individual hypostasis created hypostasis experience of the eschaton as sometimes stated ever el a will being or ever well-being um, do you agree with that kind of approach that, that that's really the true um, eschatological view of St. Maximus, that it's not universal salvation for all beings, it's each individual uh, hypostasis has the ability to uh, basically condition whether it will experience ever ill-being or well-being? I think that Maximus... Um... It's different from origin in uh, more than one way because I think uh, uh, one thing is that uh, the last uh, condition of the eschaton or the salvation uh, is not like the first condition. Uh, I think it transcends that in perfection uh, mm, right, for Maximus. Right. Yeah, so you can't fall again. Right? No, that's important, I mean, to exclude the possibility of uh, new force. I think this is part of the argumentation in the seventh ambiguum, which is very interesting, I think, where Maximus argues very philosophically for against originism in that respect, in the so-called originist myth. But then on the other hand, I think it's, um, I think somehow uh, there is a, a notion of universal salvation, Maximus, but I have to make clear what I mean with that. Yeah. Uh, because I think all beings are destined to be saved or transformed. Right. Um, but, and I think that the possibility of not being transformed or saved is present. But it's not a part of the 
uh, let's say, the normal order. It's not a part of the normal order. So that is why why I said that I think there is a notion of it uh, of um, of universal uh, salvation or transformation because that is the normal uh, thing that should be actualized. Mm-hmm. But there are exceptions, or there is there are the possibility of exceptions. Uh, at least it seems quite clear that Maximus, even though he doesn't say much about it, he thinks there are uh, there is the possibility of exceptions. So we cannot exclude that. Right. And and even the fall leaves in place uh, at least the the part of the, the participation in synergia on the part of the creature. The, the creature still has the ability to use his natural energy and will to uh, per, to participate in the divine energy and will that, that's that's this um, this process that was the whole basis of the dispute with the, the monothelites and the monoenergists. Um, mm. But that's why you're, you're, you're making this point though. So the, even though cre- the creature has a natural capacity for grace and for theosis, and this is delimited by the Logi, it doesn't necessarily mean that every intelligent creature will actualize that. They may m- will against that, right? Um, could you speak to what Maximus means by um, the practical, the contemplative, and the mystical? Yeah. Well, that is the so-called uh, doctrine of spiritual development. Uh, and I think it's very important um, because somehow that has to do with, uh, well, our selves adjusting our life to uh, the divine intention for it, Mm -hmm. namely in accordance with the the logos of our being. But it also has to do, uh, the contemplative especially, has to do with our relation to the world around us. Because for instance, in um, the Questionus Antalassium, what is the title of it uh, in the Consta's translation? Uh, the responses to Thalassius, he calls it, on difficulties in sacred scripture, responses to Thalassius in this uh, wonderful yeah. translation here. Uh, there are several places in that where Maximus speaks of the fallen condition in which we are directed to the surface appearance of created things, which triggers our desires. And I don't think, and I think that somehow a description of the normal uh, or the abnormal conditions in which we live after the fall, when we direct our interest to the aspects of greater things that can somehow uh, satisfy our needs. But in natural contemplation, it seems that the point is that one moves beyond this. Uh, The peak of the virtues is detachment and love. And when you love uh, a detachment from from, uh, the sensible aspect of creatures and love God, somehow you could get the impression that, well, then the world just is of no interest anymore. But that is not the case. It's a turning point somehow. Because loving God means that you see the world from the point of view of God and you detect the world or um, experience the world the way God wants us to experience it. And then somehow our relationship with created things are changed. We are no longer interested in the uh, aspects of of the the created world that just appeals to our senses or our desires. But we see them all as somehow manifestations of aspects of the Logos himself, God himself. So we see, so we see in, in animals, for instance, in, in flowers and vegetation, vegetation, we see uh, they, re- they reflect God somehow and tell us about aspects of God. So from the uh, so-called ascetical or practical development of virtues, uh, one advances to a renewed and different view of the cosmos and sees it somehow in its relation to God. 
Mm -hmm. And then hopefully moves further into the unity with God in the theological highest right. vision of um, A couple more questions here. One I would ask, uh, given this, uh, a picture and what we've said about the Logi and what you just said there about uh, natural contemplation, I'm curious it would be accurate to say that Maximus kind of follows a lot of the Cappadocians in their tendency to give a, uh, a real place to analogia or analogical predication, although it's not at the level of the divine essence, it relates to the energies. I mean, Basil says in letter 234 that the energies come down to us and that's the way that we name God from his operations that come down to us. And I, I read Maximus as following consistently with that, that he does believe, like St. Gorgonissa, that there's a, there is a, valid, a validity to the cap, cataphatic naming that occurs. Uh, but even if we say that, we're not saying that that's a definition of uh, the various attributes or energies that we're naming. There's still a transcendence of every one of those energies beyond the name. Yeah. But regardless, we do still have, due to God's cond uh, con condescending to us, the ability to do a degree of cataphatic naming. Would you agree with that? Yeah, well, I think there is a, there is a place in the, the question of Santalasium again that... Uh, Maximus distinguishes between, between two kinds of knowledge of God. The one knowledge is by experience, he says, and transcends um, uh, intellectual categories and concepts. Uh, and then he starts using terminology of experience and sensation, mm -hmm. uh, which is rather interesting. Uh, but the lower kind of theology uh, is that which uses concepts and analogies. And it's also, of course, very tempting to say that well, the most important kind of theology is the highest, which transcends all concepts. Right. But I think it's very important to stress the importance of the lower kind, because that is the area in which we use analogies, images, and also philosophical language. All philosophical yes. language about God uh, belongs to that level of theology. So it's the the um, uh, the. Uh, the field in which we have uh, liturgical language, theological debates, whatever. Yeah, I mean, and there's another uh, question uh, in your section where you talk about the divine hypostasis of the logos. Uh, sometimes there's confusion people have over. There's a lot of language that that's also talks about uh, him being a composite hypostasis. the The difference here is what's being picked out in what in what sense, and so. The hypostasis itself of Christ, the Logos, the second person of the Godhead, when he assumes human nature, he being the second person of the Godhead there, he doesn't undergo any change. Um, so the sense in which he's a composite hypostasis is the sense in which Chalcedon says he possesses two natures, human and divine. But the hypostasis itself, according to the Fifth Council in its edicts from uh, Justinian and the, the product of that council, it actually dealt with this question and it explained in what sense Christ is a composite hypostasis. And the sense is, is said to be that the Logos himself is divine, even in the incarnation, right? He doesn't undergo any change and there's no sense in which there's a created hypostasis in Christ. Would you, would you agree with that assessment? Oh yes, of course I would. Okay, excellent. I think that Maximus is very, uh, he knows the results of the Council of 553 very well. Excellent. And I think it's a very important aspect of his uh, Christology. Um, we got a couple of questions here. Uh, that's coming, kind of coming to the end of my um, my assessment. Um, how would you? It's kind of maybe the last kind of question here is: How would you? Would you characterize Maximus as a Christian theologian and philosopher who has sort of the fluidity? and the freedom to maybe take from Porphyry, to take from Aristotle, to take from Plato, what he sees as good arguments and useful arguments, and, and, and he's not boxed into any single tradition per se. Would, would you say that's an accurate way to, to characterize his approach? Yes, I would say it's an accurate way to put it, because uh, it seems to me that uh, he very freely integrates uh, in his thought uh, whatever he finds useful. But as I said earlier, there is no tradition in the Church Fathers of referring to the pagans, pagan philosophers. But it, it's 
it's extremely clear to me that Maximus knew uh, Alexandrian Neoplatonism or aspects of it and integrated it freely into his own Christian system and transformed right. it completely into his Christian system. Right, we've got a couple of questions here and I'll, I'll read and those. Just one, one thing sure, I want to add, because I mean, if you open a history of philosophy, whichever you like, you always find a chapter on Augustine. And I would say that if Augustine is philosophy, Maximus is, of course, philosophy as well. Yeah, exactly. I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I used to be a big uh, uh, fan of Augustine in my 20s. I read him extensively. And then as I got older and got more into Eastern Orthodox theologians and philosophers, I, I, I developed a much greater appreciation for the nuance uh, that you find in St. Maximus over uh, Augustine. But um, Maximus fan for five dollars says to you, uh, Doctor Tolson, what do uh, Saint Dionysius and Saint Maximus mean when they say that God, in knowing Himself, knows all possibilities? <laughs> Not sure. Okay. Uh, uh... Am I going to answer it really sim very simply, or uh, that's up to you. You you you're not bound to answer any if you don't want to. If you don't feel the need, if you're unsure. <laughs> no, I think it's um, uh, if this is maybe I misunderstand, but it seems to me that we are returning to something we talked about earlier mm -hmm. uh, about this that God knows uh, all possible. I don't want to make Maximus into a Leibnizian philosopher before Leibniz, right. but it seems to me that uh, uh, Maximus' uh, conception of God, uh, if you can talk about Maximus' conception of God, is very uh, uh, elastic somehow, is that God's intellect is infinite, which means that God knows everything. Right. That is uh, logically possible to know, if I may add a uh, note from uh, Richard Swinburne. But, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I thought about asking about possible worlds, and I, I even was going to bring up eternal truth and, and uh, um, you know, logically possible worlds with Leibniz, but I decided to pass over that. But uh, Duke of Earl, $5. Um, no question, he just sends 5 bucks. Thank you, Duke. Yankee D for $5 says, What is the difference between the state of the Logi within God and the state of the Logi with respect to creation in your view? I think that uh, there is a distinction in Maximus' treatment of the Logi, which also you find in uh, John Philoponos, maybe for the first time, and which is also repeated in Thomas Aquinas, as a matter of fact, namely the distinction between Logi as the um, principles of knowledge and the principles of um, making which means that uh, uh, God eternally knows uh, all possibilities and knows what he wants to create. And at the appropriate time, uh, trying to avoid going into a major philosophical problem, mm -hmm. uh, at the appropriate time, God creates in accordance with these. And they are principles of making, which means that uh, there is a plan God has, which he realizes uh, externally. Like when I contemplate to make, to paint a picture, for instance, I have an idea of it and I make it. And the picture don't participate in what I have in my mind, but it is my creation somehow. Right. Yes, there is a, a dual aspect to the Logi there. And by the way, um, I mentioned earlier uh, Father Florovsky's essay, Creation and Creaturehood, which deals with the Logi in a, in a very similar way to that, to the person who asked that question. Trad for $3. Dr. Tolleson, what is your view on the kind of distinction between individual energies in God, such as wisdom or love, and are they logically prior to creation? They are definitely prior to creation. Um, I don't see exactly the point of the distinction between individual energies and what would the other be more general ones? Yeah, or, right. I, 
uh, maybe um, this pro this question is probably hitting on um, whether and in what sense energies can be distinguished, such as the distinction between, um, you know, this is probably uh, getting into the topic that you said, you know, before when we were having the, the pre-show chat that you were kind of still fleshing out, but it's probably asking a question about the distinction between energies that relate only to the created order and energies that would be the case from all eternity, like love or glory, whether God had or had not created. Um, this is dealt with like in Capita 97 to 101 in St. Gregory Palamas's Capita. I think uh, you can say that uh, if it is possible to distinguish between an internal activity and an external activity, you may also ask the question whether the internal activity is eternal while the external is not. I think both are eternal, but I think then you have to um, ex explain exactly how the so-called external is eternal as well. Well, this would be eternal manifestation, right? The doctrine of eternal. No, I think it's an eternal manifestation of what God is internally. Right. And this does, I mean, no creature emerges from that. Right. The creature emerges when God wills, wills it. The exactly. Creature. Right. Excellent. Um, so now, is there a best place for someone to go to get the new book that's coming out? Will it be just Amazon or, or maybe from the university? Or do you have a, a place that I want that you want me to send people to get the book? Well, it will be half a year from now, I suppose, oh. that the book will um, be available, hopefully. Well, people... I'm not sure. Yet. It seems to me that I will be invited to publish it uh, by another publisher. Okay. But uh, that is an uh, issue which I have to also discuss with Oxford University Press. I see, I see. But I suppose Amazon will, of course, uh, be the place. Gotcha. So if you're watching this six months from now and you do want to get the new book, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll want to look, I guess, to Amazon to find the work. And... Dr. Tolson, thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't want to keep you too long. We've gone for a little over an hour. It's been a great discussion. Um, is there anything that you wanted to uh, comment on, Maximus, before we close the interview? I don't think so. Thank you very much for this talk. It was very interesting and very nice, I think. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it was an honor, and uh, uh, God bless, and you have a great day. Thank you. The same.